joint venture as Oxford's Cotswold Archaeology. Um, because the case study that I'll be sharing with you later today is one of our um, OCAs and we effect affectionately refer to ourselves as projects. Delivering public benefits is foundational to professional archaeological practice. But our current methodologies and the complex timelines of project approval, finance and planning rarely facilitate the full realisation of those benefits. My intention today is to unpack this statement and demonstrate through recent case study how changes in our methodologies can empower us to realise public benefits that leave a legacy long after our involvement ends. So for those of us who are professionally accredited or are working for senior registered organisations, it is embedded in our code of conduct that members with due regard to their fundamental responsibility to the interests of the public and that we take responsibility for informing the public of the purpose and results of our work. And this is reflected in the partnerships we build and the stakeholders with which we consult. In our professional practice, we work closely with organisations and institutes who represent the public interest, such as Historic England, and the fundamental importance of public benefit is also reflected in the charitable status of many archaeological units. And for those of us providing commercial heritage services, the priority of public benefit is reinforced in the planning system and the associated legislation where it is understood to be a key component of sustainable development practice. In England and some parts of Wales, the Social Value Act requires those who commission public services to think about how they can secure wider social, economic and environmental benefits, collectively referred to as social value. I've recently worked on a project proposal for an infrastructure project in Wales, and in this context we've tailored our project to the Wellbeing for Future Generations Act and make sure that we take due consideration of this act which requires public bodies to work towards achieving well-being goals for collective employers. Now, I don't have personal experience working in Scotland or Northern Ireland, but I understand um, from Sylvie Watson's work and also from mention in the CEQA toolkit this morning, and shout out to the CEQA toolkit, that's launched yesterday, and I'll speak a little bit more on that in a moment. Um, but I understand that there are revisions to Scotland's national planning policy and Northern Ireland's archaeology strategy 2030, which are also both outlining the need to embed public benefit provision into our best practice. And this is all underlined by the specific value of heritage assets as outlined in the National Planning Policy Framework as being worth protecting due to the role they have in contributing to the quality of life for existing and future generations. And what I hope this brief summary has made clear, and I appreciate that a lot of this is possibly familiar to us all, but I think it's worth repeating, is that ensuring public benefit from our work is not only our responsibility as professionals, but it's of significant importance to our clients, stakeholders and heritage partners. It is not an add-on, it is of fundamental importance. And when we're talking about public benefit, it's really important to clarify that the work we do to record, research and disseminate information about our shared past is important and worthwhile. That is not in dispute. But knowledge creation alone does not sufficiently address our professional obligations to deliver public benefit. As Olivia wrote, true public benefit requires us to understand public needs and interests and to demonstrate how our work and research can address those concerns. Nor do the standard practices of excavation, archiving and dissemination meet the social value requirements of our clients and legislation either. As outlined by Sadie Watson, social value is not created through the standard operations of an organisation, it should be beyond business as usual. And we are increasingly expanding our understanding of the potential of archaeological practice and material to address community concerns and societal challenges. Just this morning, we heard from colleagues sharing projects where evaluation is showing that engaging with archaeology is improving participant well-being, it's offering upskilling opportunities to people out of employment, and it's protecting fragile ecosystems, just to name a couple of examples. And therefore, we, as a sector, we are in an excellent position to have a tangible, real-life impact on communities and individuals that we come into contact with for our work. So why then do we so often struggle to deliver on this potential? Speaking from personal experience, one contributing factor is that archaeologists who specialise in community engagement and social value are rarely drawn into a project until it's already a good way through the project cycle. Sometimes this can be as late as the middle of the, or the end of the fieldwork, or even in preparation for analysis. On large-scale projects, there are occasions where we are asked to answer public benefit questions and tender documentation, and there are also occasions where the need for community engagement is outlined in WSI or 
or even as a chronic condition. But in my experience, there can often be a gap of months, if not years, from when these documents are produced and engagement specialists are again called on to be active parts of the project. Now, as you can imagine, this creates a host of challenges to delivering meaningful public input. Late input by its very nature often means that we're working to a very restricted timescale, um, and sometimes with limited or insufficient funds, it kind of stands to reason that if community engagement hasn't been an ongoing part of the conversation up until this late point in the project, that there is a risk associated that there will not be sufficient resource to deliver on even the initial ideas, let alone what you may have realised is actually proportionally appropriate at the later stage of the project. Arguably, most important to me is that often you reach the stage of being asked to deliver with very little to no understanding specific audiences are that you're being asked to deliver to and what their needs and their interests are. I would much rather have very little time and a limited budget but know who I'm delivering to because at least I can be sure that what I am proposing as an initiative is actually going to meet local need. It might not be as um, grand in scale as I might have hoped but it will actually directly meet need um, and that's really important to me. I'd also say that because in this scenario you haven't had the opportunity to properly understand these local audiences, and as we've established, not enough time and enough resources to address that issue, um, it's also very difficult to evaluate. You can evaluate the success of the initiative, as in that you know, people enjoy it themselves, that they learn something, there's a certain amount of evaluation you can do. But if you don't have a baseline understanding of this is the local need, and this is how I have helped to address that, it's very, very difficult. Demonstrate the public benefit that you are having. So, as a result, you often stick with what you know well, and you are certain that you can deliver in the time and budget. And I say you, I could be talking to myself. <laughs> familiar deliverables often serve familiar audiences, and the narrow scope of these initiatives typically results in a restricted legacy for the upgrade of the scheme. And this scenario is likely familiar to many of you, and ones that haven't given a specific example here. I hope you can see how these challenges and outcomes are common to many of our projects, and that this approach is not enabling us to deliver public benefit to the standard that we should aspire to. So I'll spend the rest of my time sharing with you about an opportunity I've had recently to do this differently. The joint venture of Oxford Cotswold Archaeology is currently working on the A66 Northern Trans Pennine Road Improvement Scheme. This is a National Highways project. Um, and we're working to multiple clients. So there's Alpha BT Atkins here and Kelp Ray, who are collectively known as the Delivery Integration Partners, or the DIPS. Um, and for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the route, the A66 is one of North England's most significant, and if I may say, most dangerous, um, routeways travelling east to west through Cumbria and Yorkshire. And this is really just the latest in a history of upgrades because this route has been a significant routeway since Great History. The project is currently focused on sites between Penrith and Brough, and our archaeological field teams to date have been completing outstanding evaluation and outstanding as in remaining, but also outstanding work. I mean, they worked so hard over this very cold, very wet winter and provided us with some of the fun photographs that you see in this presentation. So, outstanding in, in many levels. And they found some incredible archaeological process. I mean, being so close to Hadrian's Wall, you'd expect um, quite a lot of Roman, as you can see pictured here. Um, I'd also allowed to say, because there has been a press release about this, that we found some incredible late upper Paleolithic finds in situ, and it's just, just incredible archaeology coming out of the scheme, so please do keep your eyes peeled um, on the project as it develops. So, back to what I should be talking about, not being distracted by the archaeology itself. Um, due to consultant compliance support and advocacy for engagement, we were able to build a comprehensive programme of research and development during this evaluation stage, which will shape and tailor our future engagement plans. This has included two key documents. The first is a Heritage Community Engagement Plan. Uh, this is an audience mapping document which involves desk based research and consultation with local organisations and stakeholders to identify audiences, um, their interests, and their priorities. And this data is combined with the client social value objectives. Model, which you may be more familiar with as a mental theory of change model. Um, and that model is then summarised into six impact aims that reflected the common themes and represent our engagement strategy. This plan sits alongside the localism and sustainability plan, which very explicitly addresses each of the social value indicators.
is the breed by the A66 delivery integration plants. And this gives us the best of both worlds because the local sustainability plan lets us very clearly demonstrate how we can support clients in meeting their social value performance indicators, whilst the heritage community engagement plan illustrates the expanded opportunities to generate social value and public benefits that can happen with archaeology but that might not be fully represented within the social value indicators themselves. Our current work is focused on creating a detailed delivery plan and evaluation framework. So how are we going to realise the strategy and how are we going to evaluate whether um, we've done what we set out to do and met our ambitions. Um, and these will outline how we work to realise the strategy. So though we're in the early stages of this project delivery, it's already possible to reflect on the benefits of this extensive approach and early intervention. I mean, to state the obvious, we've got a lot more time than we would normally. <laughs> We're in at the beginning, and that means we can have conversations. There is time for us to research, to consult, to explore ideas, and to build relationships. That's particularly significant, I think, on big infrastructure projects like this, is that the teams are massive, and it can be very, very difficult to find the right people to speak to <laughs> and to build those relationships and build that trust, especially if you're potentially speaking slightly different languages and you're trying to, to work out how to communicate with one another. And because we've been involved early, we're also able to create some detailed costings and have really early conversations about how we're going to resource the delivery of the strategy. And significantly, that's happening at the same time as we're having other budget discussions about how we're going to resource the field work and the archiving and all these elements. It's an embedded part of the entire project rather than being treated as something that should be costed amongst it separately. The audience mapping has also given us a really clear understanding of who our new and existing audiences are for the project has identified the needs and interests of local people and stakeholders. And therefore, we can be confident that the detailed engagement plan we develop at the back of the strategy should reflect local priorities. For example, every single person we spoke to when we did our consultation mentioned the lack of accessible transport and how difficult it could be to get around the schemes. It's a very dispersed rural community um, with so many different parishes um, involved as well. So it's very difficult for people to, to travel around and engage even in their daily lives, lots of people are commuting, they don't want to get back in their cars and travel out again. It's really, really difficult for them. And so we're exploring a variety of possible solutions to increase accessibility. We haven't decided which of these we're going for, but to illustrate some of the ideas that we're considering, we're looking at whether we can provide travel bursaries, whether there's a way that we can switch up shuttle buses to try and help people get to um, uh, the different initiatives that we might run. But also, how can we take our initiatives to them? If it's difficult for our communities to get to us, let's work out how we can get to where they are. The audience mapping has also given us um, a much better understanding of some of the audiences that we're not necessarily serving very well at the moment. So, particularly, the audience mapping has identified gypsy, Romani, and traveller communities as being key audiences that are impacted by this development. Now, I'll be completely honest with you, I don't have experience working with these communities, um, and I'm aware that this is something engage with really thoughtfully, um, but it's also really important that we want to do really well. And so identifying this audience early in the project means that we've got time to work out how to do that, that we can find partners that we can talk to that can help us develop a program that can be genuinely meaningful um, and actually can deliver some public benefit to these communities. It's also helped us understand our existing audiences better. So we spoke to a lot of the local archaeology and history societies said, you know, we want to deliver some public benefit, what would be meaningful to you? So we know them quite well in, in the scope of our audiences, they're not, you know, generally relatively well, but actually, why should we assume that we know what they want? We should probably ask them as well. And so they've identified all the skills training opportunities that they're looking for to help support sustainability and the legacy of their groups. And so that's something we're also seeing how we might be able to address within our engagement plan. This strategy also means we can appropriately evaluate the success of our engagement program in delivering benefit, which is incredibly significant. And it also means if we can um, build into the interim reporting, which we're hoping to with the evaluation framework, we can adapt our approach if we find that our initiatives are falling short. And it gives us a scope to adapt and change. Um, the logic model that we produce, the theory of change, also very clearly indicates that it's not going to be the engagement initiatives themselves that are necessarily going to produce the desired public benefits alone. But it's going to be the strategies that we employ in their development and delivery. For example, we're prioritizing collaboration with local partners. We want to develop with rather than simply deliver to, so that 
they're empowered to continue engaging with archaeology, adapting resources, re-delivering programs, and much more, hopefully leaving a sustainable legacy for the public benefit that we hope can continue long after our work on the project is completed. I was hearing this morning of some incredible volunteer projects um, run by the National Trust and others, and just thought how fantastic to be able to work with the community over an extended period of time. That's not really the context that I work in. You know, often we talk about being sort of parachuted into development projects, and we're there for a time, and then we move on. And it's so important that um, we leave something that's sustainable when they're gone. And one of the best ways to do that is for us to work with local partners. It also helps us understand what's already happening. Um, I personally am quite interested in we're working with local communities to promote, preserve heritage at risk. And I kind of wondered when I went into this, well, I wonder if there might be scope for that. And I realized our local partners are already doing that. They're doing that really, really well. That's not what they need us to come and provide for them. So, again, it really helps us challenge ourselves with our own ideas and thoughts. Starting with strategy is changing my approach to project design. I'm able to determine which initiatives to propose and assess their value for money based on our understanding of the audiences and how successfully the initiative will help meet the outcomes needed to meet public interest. Without time and resource for audience mapping and consultation, we risk reinforcing our interests and values instead, as I just illustrated, and speaking to the same audiences who already feel well represented and engaged by existing heritage engagement. One of the key areas of discussion for this session is to consider how we can collaborate with others to shape the future. This change in approach that we're experiencing on the A626, it hasn't developed in a vacuum. It's the convergence of ongoing research, practice, and discourse. I am very aware that I'm in a, a wonderful space where I'm benefiting from the work, the pioneering work, I should say, of my colleagues in other units and in other research spaces. Sadie Watson and her research team in particular have played a significant role in redefining our industry's approach to public benefit framing our current context and advocating for change needed to meet our obligations to the public. I mentioned earlier that the Secular Community Toolkit um, was launched on their website yesterday. Please do have a look at that. It's an incredible resource that is designed to help us embed public benefit from the outset of our projects and throughout. You know, I, I am not standing here saying these are my ideas. I'm very, very much aware that incredible work has been done and this case study is a reflection of what can happen about best practice are actually able to be implemented. And in fact, as I was preparing for this talk, I became aware of a recent paper by Sadie Watson um, in which she proposes a new project design methodology with public benefit at its core. And you can see on the screen part of her revision of the typical project life cycle, where she's mapped out various milestones for public benefit um, that can be incorporated into project design. And though our process doesn't quite perfectly match up um, with her proposed life cycle, there are shared priorities and motivations here that encourages me that we are moving in the right direction. Nor can our work on the A66 be solely credited to the engagement teams. Um, our consultancy teams from Atkins Realis, RPS, and Jacobs, spearheaded by Alan Ford and Leo Jazz are also involved in that, have just been pivotal advocates, pivotal and passionate advocates, ensuring that we're embedded and connected within the project. That's not something that I could have achieved on my own. We really do all need to work together. And so I invite you, as I come to a close, to think about your role. Where might you be able to influence the project life cycle to ensure that public benefit is embedded? Where can you facilitate earlier engagement, involvement, and champion audience research? The social value of archaeology does not necessarily depend on the significance of the discoveries made about people in the past. It is shaped by the needs and interests of people today. When engagement specialists are involved early in the project design process and are adequately resourced, we are better able to understand these needs and to provide genuine and tangible benefits to local communities. The truth is, I've spent the last 15 to 20 minutes explaining something that's actually quite simple. Foundations come first. Delivering public benefit is foundational to our professional practice, and so it should be an embedded part of the project design process from the first moment 